Randall Balmer, the, a professor of American religious history at Barnard uh, uh, College, Columbia University, says that the emphasis on the apocalypse and the individual salvation in the left behind books. Now listen to what he says here. Now I'm, I'm not gonna tell you right up front, I don't agree with everything the guy says, but it's worth listening to. We need to hear this. That it can foster a passivity on the part of Christians when it comes to dealing with the problems of the world. I call it the theology of despair. It says in effect, there's nothing we can do to reform society. There's nothing we can do but wait for Jesus to return. Well, let me just stop and say, I would have to say that I agree with his, his in thinking there, even though I don't necessarily agree with their take on it, because to be honest with you, most churches today do not believe in the tribulation. They don't believe in the rapture. They don't believe in the literal physical return of Christ. They don't believe in the importance of the nation of Israel and all the other things. It's, 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 it's allegorical. And I'm talking about the majority of churches in America. <clears throat> I think uh, from what I understand, uh, Pastor Josh is doing a series with you guys right now on comparative religions. And you're gonna find even among Christians, professing Christians, <clears throat> there's an issue at hand about this. Other writers, and scholars have criticized the books for the implicit message that since the end is near, Christians have few obligations except to save souls. That division hard, that division's hardly new. Listen to this. The relative emphasis on winning converts versus doing good works is one of the fundamentals that divides conservative and liberal churches in America. Well, let me just tell you something. <clears throat> we need to pay attention to what was just said there because if we fundamental Christians, we conservative Bible believing that takes the scriptures literally, if we do not pay attention to this, we will find ourselves getting into a trap on this topic of end times. This for us folks is not to let us just say, ho-hum, the world's just gonna go to hell, let's just keep looking for a hole in the sky. If that's your attitude, I got news for you, that's not a biblical one. Matter of fact, the guy goes on to say, but if the ideals of the novel are carried to their logical conclusion, there's not much for people to do ex but accept Christ and wait for the second coming. From the point of view of encouraging efforts for peace, protecting the environment, helping victims of AIDS or famine. The left behind mindset works against all this, says Paul Boyer, professor of history at University of Wisconsin-Madison. It encourages a passivity, <clears throat> excuse me, in addressing important issues. Now, let me just tell you, the guy's totally liberal. And I think that's why you see the tendency for these type of people to say, well, it's kind of stupid for us to think about Jesus coming when when the world's gone the way it's always been. This is exactly what Peter said would be an indicator of the last day. They would say, well, it's been this way since the very beginning. And the Bible says they're willing and ignorant and there'll be scoffers who will mock where is the promise of his coming. Well, I have to tell you something. We do believe the Lord is coming. And if you've kept uh, your pulse, your finger on the pulse, it's obvious the Lord is coming soon. But that does not give you and I a day off. If anything, we should work the harder because our time is running out. Are you all with me tonight? <clears throat> you say, why do you say that for? Well, Jesus put it this way. And if Jesus talked like this, obviously you and I should as well. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Well, how many know, technically, Jesus is now not in the world? Guess who's now the light of the world? You and I, Christians. The scripture said it in Matthew 5. Jesus says, you are the light of the world. And then he notes it this way. A city that's set on a hill cannot be hid. It's as obvious as can be. If you've seen a, a lit up city at nighttime, it's sticking out like a sore thumb. 
Neither do men light a candle, put it on their bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light to all that are in the house. Let your light so shine. Now here's the part that the liberals love and the conservatives hate, but it's the same Jesus talking. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Now, if we arrive to the end of this series on our fourth Wednesday night, and it has not challenged you to be a better believer, not challenged you to be a better husband or a better wife, a better grandparent, a better citizen, a better husband, better wife, better son, better daughter, better church member, whatever the case might be, then I'd have to say I have failed to do my part in giving you the whole counsel of God on this issue. But as a result of this, I pray that as the result of you watching this, it will challenge you and make you more what God wants you and I all to be. Amen? <clears throat> Remember when Jesus said, you're the salt of the earth? And we talked about that a second ago. But then he, <clears throat> he adds a very important statement here. If the salt has lost its savor, now that's not savior, it's savor. That's the ability for salt to entice or to make flavor come out or to preserve. When it's lost its ability to be salt, wherewith shall it be salty? You can't salt salt and get it to become salty again. Once it loses that ability, then Jesus said, it's thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden under the foot of men. And I'm, gonna, I'm working on a message right now called Good for Nothing Christians. And I'll tell you the reason why I'm working on this because I see this passage saying a lot to you and I about some of us have become good for nothing. All we do is we warm a pew on Sundays and on Wednesdays and we pretty much go the rest of our week doing nothing constructive for the kingdom of God and really not affecting our world as far as salt and light. So that's really kind of the introduction to this series, and I hope it'll be um, a little bit of a focus for where we're going to go with this. Now let's really get into the meat of our message tonight. Is everybody still with me after that? Okay, good. <clears throat> I'm about ready to show you three people. Uh, and I see a lot of people here that are old enough these faces will ring a bell because they're not too far back in history to not at least be on our records and remember reading about them. But these forerunners, these three forerunners are what I like to call forerunners of the Antichrist. They're the three world's most worst, the worst mass murderers. And what is unique about these three men, they all use the identical political concept. What makes this so scary though is that their concept is becoming revived in our last days, in these last days, and even in our very own nation. Now, a minute ago, remember I talked about the spirit of Antichrist? Here in 1 John 4, 3, it talks about this spirit of Antichrist is already in the world today. Now, John was talking about that back before the turn of the first century. If it was true then, here we are, 1,900 years later, and I can literally say without any fear of contradiction that the spirit of Antichrist is still prevalent. It will be there. That's the mystery of iniquity that Paul was talking about. And how you see it though is when you look at the, the numbers you see there, the 35 million in the middle, and the 62 million to the left, and then the 21 million, those are human lives that were destroyed under a political concept. Those three men were the head of the three greatest Soviet or socialist movements in the world. Obviously, the Russian one, the Chinese one, and then, of course, uh, Germans under the leadership of uh, Stalin and Mao and Hitler. Now, why I want to bring this out to you t tonight is because, folks, Socialism is making headway in the United States of America like no other time before. Now, why I want to share this with you is because I remember back in the 60s when it was making its 
debut again, even back then. Of course, it is rehashed from back in the 30s. But let me just read something to you from the Old Testament. My favorite book of the Bible is Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes. 